Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Arthur Millick. I'm the executive director of the Center for the American Way of Life, which is Cl the Claremont Institute's new initiative in Washington, D.C. And our goal here is very basic, uh, though somewhat complicated, and it is to make the right more honest and therefore more useful to the nation, uh, and two, to do battle against wokeness and the institutions that it's captured. And uh, tonight it is my honor to introduce one of my favorite people in general, but certainly one of the greatest uh, China analysts uh, of our day, David Goldman, who is a Washington fellow with us at the Center for the American Way of Life. Uh, you will uh, see a copy of his newest book, You Will Be Assimilated, uh, and he'll talk to us about his book tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Arthur. I'm very honored by the invitation from Claremont, an organization which I've had uh, association with uh, for, for many years and uh, does wonderful work. Um, the topic on which I was asked to speak is what is China's grand design? In a word, it's to restore China to the central place in the world, which China had for the majority of the past 5,000 years. What distinguished China from the other civilizations of the ancient world, uh, none of which has, apart from China, has survived, is infrastructure, technology, and administration. And I, in fundamental ways, I think the China of today is not much different from ancient China. The, dis the most important fact about ancient China is that wet agriculture irrigated in the floodplains of the Yangtze and Yellow River valleys produced about six to eight times as much calories per acre as the dry agriculture of the Middle East and Europe. So China was able to maintain a level of population density and create a level of wealth uh, half an order of magnitude larger than any of the other civilizations. To accomplish this in the floodplains required <coughs> massive uh, natural improvements starting no later than 5,000 years ago according to the archaeologists. Uh, the floodplains had to be managed for irrigation and for flood control. Uh, the downside of this, of course, is that every once in a while you'd have a massive flood, which would kill half your population, lead to foreign invasions, plague, dynastic overthrow, and so forth. So having a very large and dense population had its downside. But the requirements <coughs> of a large riparian state always demanded a large administrative caste, the Mandarin caste, uh, and an educational system to handle it, and a large state to do this. And given the fact that natural disasters would lead to the destruction of very large parts of the population, the state tended to be somewhat cavalier about its treatment of human life in the process of managing its affairs. There was a 200-year interruption in China's central place in the world, which no longer became the wealthiest or most powerful part of the world, and the last hundred years of that, from the Opium Wars to the Communist Revolution, are called by the Chinese the century of humiliation, which were indeed a, a horrifying period. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion of the 19th century uh, killed anywhere from 25 to 100 million people. The Japanese killed 25 million people during World War II, and anywhere from 25 to 80 million people were killed by Mao through starvation and the Great Leap Forward. So the experience of the Chinese people uh, over the last several generations has been challenging, to put it mildly. Cannibalism is a living memory in China from the Great Leap Forward. So to the extent the Chinese prefer stability, order, and prosperity, uh, this is not a surprising result. Now. That's what China is and has been. Uh, the one thing that China's grand design does not include, and I think we often make a mistake about this, is an effort to impose China's political system on the rest of the world. 
When you ask the Chinese about this and you say, well, don't you want to impose your system on the rest of the world? They say, you should be so lucky. You barbarians aren't capable of having our political system. The key to our political system, they'll tell you, is the Gauko, the university entrance exam. And it's not the success rate, but the failure rate which conditions the system. 10 million Chinese high school students study their hearts out for years to take the Gaoko. The average Chinese family spends a year's pay on tutoring. 50% of them pass and get university places. And the bar is set intentionally by the Communist Party in order to achieve the maximum level of motivation, 50% failure rate in the Chinese view, is the ideal to get everyone to work the hardest. To get into the advanced classes at Chinese high schools requires literally seven days of study. They've had to introduce calisthenics because kids were coming out literally physically stunted uh, by the amount of time they put, uh, they put in studying. Uh, and, and out of this the selected few who make it to universities, uh, the Chinese pick out high achievers and make them members of the Communist Party. With a population of 1.4 billion, just, just for my own benefit, let me ask a question. How many members do you think there are of the Chinese Communist Party? 10 million? 20 million? Any guesses? 30 million? 200 million? 93 million. 10% of the adult population. So the co-optation of, Ch of the Chinese high achievers into the Chinese Communist Party makes it a very powerful organization as long as it can deliver the uh, economic benefits that the Chinese trade in exchange for lack of privacy, arbitrary political detention, and other things that we in the West consider despicably repugnant. Now, <clears throat> Chinese universities were basically raised to the ground by Mao under the Cultural Revolution. Since then, if you look at the major surveys of the world's best engineering schools, all of the leading Chinese universities turn up on the list. Not all of the Chinese universities are excellent, but many of them are. And when the Chinese graduate six times as many engineers at the, at the uh, bachelor level as we do, it may not be six times the intellectual firepower, but it's maybe three or four times. It's an enormous effort. Uh, the reason they're good is because we in the United States trained their faculty. For years, 80% of computer science PhD candidates and electrical engineering PhD candidates were foreign, of which by far the largest contingent was Chinese, and as a result of which we have a world-class Chinese system. Why didn't we keep them here? Many of them we, you know, would have gladly stayed. The answer is only 5% of American undergraduates study engineering. There aren't a lot of jobs for engineering PhD candidates in teaching. It's basically a teaching degree. So they go back to China, they get very good salaries, laboratory facilities, and so forth. So we effect handed them a world-class faculty. So we're not talking about something remotely resembling Russian communism, where it was party loyalty and vodka that made you a member of the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party are the high achievers of China. Bill Buckley famously said that he would rather be ruled by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the faculty of Harvard University. I agree with him. China is the other alternative where an educated elite rules everybody else, arbitrarily, brutally, with very little concern for individual rights, which don't exist, and often little concern for human rights, but with a great deal of sophistication in terms of technology and management. And the Chinese look at us and say, as a friend of mine did, now you're going through your cultural evolution. Not only do we have 
of our undergraduates studying engineering, we've turned our engineering departments off to diversity hiring officers. So if anything, we've gone in the wrong direction. So what is China's, China's method of expansion in the ancient world was to build water management, including some technological miracles which still exist. The Dongjiang water management project near Chengdu is something that would challenge the sophistication of supercomputers today. That's what irrigated the Sichuan Plain, made Sichuan the breadbasket of China and gave the original Qin Dynasty, out of which China's named, the, the economic power to conquer its neighbors. The equivalent of that today is what the Chinese call the Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's a combination of technology and infrastructure by which China proposes to dominate the heartland, the Eurasian landmass, and large parts of the rest of the world as well. And the technologies on which the Chinese have concentrated include things like medical, artificial intelligence, ranging from pandemic control to telemedicine to pharmace uh, pharmaceutical research, industrial and mining robotics, uh, smart cities, smart logistics, fintech, about which I'll say more in a bit. And at, at the foundation of all of this is a fast broadband. We in the West tend to look at broadband as an entertainment technology. 5G is great because you can download your favorite movie in 30 seconds instead of three minutes. The Chinese look at it as an industrial technology. It's like the railroads in the 19th century. Before you had railroads, agricultural machinery was something of a waste of time because if you were sitting in a farm in Illinois, you could produce all the wheat you wanted, but if you had to deliver it by ox cart, you had a radius of exactly 50 miles because after that, the oxen would eat the wheat. You had to feed them on something. Once you had railroads, uh, all the agricultural machinery suddenly became a hot commodity because farmers could produce an arbitrarily large surplus and ship it cheaply by railroads and feed industrial workers cheaply and create the Industrial Revolution. So, the railroads were not particularly profitable in the 19th century, but they were a carrier technology that made dozens of other technologies possible. That's what 5G is supposed to do. And associated with that is the broader infrastructure program called the Belt and Road Initiative, which is building not just broadband, but ports, railways, uh, roads, and other um, infrastructure across uh, Eurasia. Now, the way the Chinese look at this is it, the con in terms of the concept of control point. This was explained to me in an interview, which is in the book, by the, uh, the chief technology officer of Huawei, who said, if you look at the 20th century, what was the control point? It was oil, pumping and transporting oil. So you look at sea lanes where oil was transported, look at countries, where oil was dr uh, drilled. These were the key places over which wars were fought. World, World War II was probably lost because Hitler, to Hitler because he decided to divert the army at the gates of Moscow into the Caucasus to get control of the oil. That was the control point. Today, the control point is the porting and storage of data in machine-readable form. I'll give you an example. China currently has the digitized medical records and sequenced DNA of close to a billion people. Huawei expects to get another billion people from outside China onto their servers with the same level of information over the next 10 years. With that, every pharmaceutical company in the world that wants to do research on drug interactions, on genetic susceptibilities, and so forth will have to come to the Chinese and use their databases because the artificial intelligence analysis of medical records and DNA is the fastest way to develop new drugs. And as the chief technology officer of Huawei put it, he said, we don't want to control everything. We want everyone to be our partner. We want to control the data that everyone has to come to us. We become the hub of the world. 
The same is true with artificial intelligence as applied to robotics. We worry about the erosion of America's industrial base. China's the biggest market for robotics in the world. With 5G communications, robots can talk to each other and program themselves. You tell them what kind of part you want, and the ro robots from different manufacturers in the factory floor will work it out. The Chinese are already doing this. Agriculture. In Brazil, Malaysia, Turkey, as well as China, Huawei is installing sensors on farms connected to a 5G local network, which determine how much pesticide, water, and insecticide every plant's plant needs, transmit the information to a fleet of drones, which come and deliver it. It's like the Israeli drip agriculture, but an order of magnitude more sophisticated. To the extent the United States has been reduced to an exporter of soybeans, our largest export, uh, the Chinese hope to make Brazil able to push us out of the market, be completely independent of the United States on food. Now, <clears throat> the military applications of this are extensive that's a whole to other topic we can get to in the discussion period. I note that uh, uh, Eric Schmidt, the former head of Google, and Robert Work, former Deputy Secretary of Defense under the Obama administration, earlier this week released a report from the National Security Council for Artificial Intelligence. It's about the length of War and Peace, 750 pages. I haven't read all of it yet, but it contains a wealth of information on AI applications. Uh, to the military. <clears throat> Obvious case is uh, uh, drone swarms. If you have sufficient computing capacity and sophistication of algorithms, you don't need fighter planes anymore. You can set up a lot of cheap drones that can wipe out anything that currently uh, uh, is in the air. Uh, Chinese military policy has focused on vitiating America's military edge in the Pacific. Uh, through uh, missile technology, submarines, and other anti-axis and area denial weapons, uh, the Chinese want to, to keep the Americans hundreds of miles from their coasts and convince the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, and everyone else, of course, Taiwan, that the United States can't defend them. Um, and, of course, this we are, we're in a technology arms race now, which is... Uh, a long discussion, but the Chinese have come a great, a long way. Um, you get different answers uh, from this from different military people you talk to, but I think it's highly probable that the Chinese do have missiles that can kill American carriers and that we don't currently have adequate defenses uh, against that. Now, <clears throat> this is China trying to restore its global role to the status it occupied through most of its 5,000-year history. There is a school of thought represented by people like Graham Allison at Harvard, who wrote a famous book called The Thucydides Trap, which I reviewed for Claremont Review of Books, in case you're interested, which basically says this isn't going to be too bad. If it's inevitable, lie back and enjoy it. The Chinese are going to become a major power, there's nothing we can do about it, so we just have to accept that fact. I do not believe that China's ascent to number one status in the world would be in any way a benign event for the United States of America. I think it would be traumatic. I don't think we're going to have the Red Army patrolling the streets of Chicago, and I don't believe that we're going to have Oh, shooting war, if the Chinese can help it. The Chinese have always tried to win without war um, what they can. Uh, but the consequences for the United States would be terrible. And there's, I think, a very simple reason for it. It has to do with the nature of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. We are in a winner-take-all world. There's room for only one Microsoft. Once you have the network effect of office tools that everybody uses, everyone else has to use them. There's a network effect for Facebook. You don't have Facebook and MySpace. 
you have Facebook, because once there's a place to go for social media, everybody has to go there. And the fact that the United States has a tech sector with a market capitalization of trillions of dollars, Apple and uh, Microsoft alone are more than $2 trillion in market capitalization, has enabled us <coughs> to get away with a lot of fiscal sins, which we otherwise might not have. Right now, we're running a budget deficit. It's something like 20% of gross domestic product, which is staggering. We haven't done that since 1945. Uh, both the Trump administration, under conditions of duress, and the Biden administration have chosen to inject glucose into the patient uh, building up debt at a spectacular rate. And what does it mean to have a national debt, which is 1.5% times GDP? That's Italy. If the interest rate on government debt goes up by only three percentage points, that's a trillion dollars of additional interest that the federal government has to pay. And that busts our entitlement programs and our ability to satisfy political constituencies at uh, removes the currency with which we buy social peace. The Chinese are well aware of this, and one might say facetiously that China's grand design is to sit back and wait for the United States to bankrupt itself. Just uh, this week, uh, there uh, was a commentary in the Observer website, Owancha.cn, which is a hawkish site close to the Chinese State Council, which said, and I quote, with the special status of the U.S. dollar as a world currency, the United States never has to worry about the repayment of national debt because it can be repaid by expanding the issuance of U.S. dollars. That's modern monetary theory, by the way. But can the United States continue to issue bonds to stimulate the economy and increase wealth? Can it last forever? In other words, can the U.S. debt grow without limits? U.S. debt expansion is unsustainable and it is destined to face this, hit the ceiling of the market. How will that happen? Well, China is the most advanced practitioner of national digital currencies. It's experimenting with the digital yuan, which would basically transform the world banking system into something like a giant alley pay, where you have instantaneous payments attached to uh, transparent movement of goods tracked by a distributed ledger, by a blockchain system. Right now, how are, we, how are we indeed getting away with these vast deficits? Well, the rest of the world has lent us $25 trillion. That's the benefit to the United States of having world reserve currency. That's my estimate based on BI at Bank for International Settlements data. 16 trillion is the bank deposits in U.S. dollars that are held as working capital for international trade, and 8 trillion is foreign ownership of U.S. Treasury debt. So that's more than a year's gross domestic product. If the digital yuan and other digital currencies begin to replace these working balances in the banking system, then this, what you call seniorage, the royalty, so to speak, the rent that we receive for having world reserve currency, will disappear exactly at the point where we're trying to borrow vast amounts. The rest of the world, in other words, will be cashing in their investments in the U.S. And if at the same time, China's companies become the dominant companies of the fourth industrial revolution, and the Apples and the Microsofts and so forth fade, and China's market capitalization replaces the United States, then we look like Britain in the 1960s and 1970s during the Sterling Crisis, where the lights go out in Piccadilly Circus, electricity works three days a week, and you throw pensioners you know, off the payroll. Then it gets brutal. And if you look at the social conditions of the United States in the last couple of years, the effect of this on American the American body politic would be terrifying. And that's what the Chinese have in mind for us. So if we simply go down the path of least resistance, 
as Graham Allison and other people close to the Biden administration suggest, our best case scenario is looking like Britain in the late 60s and 1970s. But we're not, we don't have the kind of social cohesion of the British monarchy. I think the result would be much worse. So where do we stand after four years of confrontation with China from the Trump administration? The answer is not, not that well. Trump used a combination of tariffs and technology boycotts to try to slow China down. They have had some effect, but not enough to slow China sufficiently to make a difference. China used a combination of massive surveillance of location of smartphones, as well as some very sophisticated artificial intelligence uh, systems to locate prospective out uh, outbreaks of COVID-19 in order to control the pandemic. And it was the only major country to control the pandemic quickly. Well, South Korea uh, and Taiwan, of course, did, uh, smaller countries. So China was the only major economy to grow during 2020 uh, and is expected to grow at 8 to 9% next year, or this year rather, 2021, roughly twice the level of the United States. China's exports to the United States are running as the fourth quarter of last year at a $580 billion annual rate. It's an all-time record. When Donald Trump came in, the, came in, the annual rate was $430 billion. The result of pouring all this sugar into the patient, uh, creating, it from, what, $5 trillion of economic stimulus to demand, is to outstrip any possible ability of the American industrial base to satisfy the demand. So China picked it up. We have not decoupled from China. We have recoupled with a vengeance. We're more dependent on China for imports than ever before, especially in the consumer electronics, which are so much in demand during the quarantine and lockdowns and uh, in medical equipment. China is the major source of world demand right now. So you see headlines in the DK to the effect that Japan Incorporated is betting on China. You have Angela Merkel telling Biden during the Munich Security Conference last week, we're allies, but our interests may diverge. The rest of the world is orienting towards where the money is coming from, and the money, sadly, has been coming from China. China now has 70% of the world's 5G base stations installed. China, Chinese bought 70% of the world's 5G smartphones. That, by the way, is one of the major reasons for the chip shortage. Uh, smartphones take up about 60% of world demand for chips, and 5G smartphones use about half, again, as much chip content as 4G smartphones. It, it may be the case that the tech boycott that the Trump administration imposed and the Biden administration has not lifted will slow China's 5G rollout to some extent. So it's certainly true that China has been hurt to some extent, but Never in history has an established power succeeded in suppressing a challenger by denying access to technology. Technology is eventually assimilated and reproduced elsewhere. So we, we may well have created a monster. The Chinese are putting massive amounts of effort into building their domestic chip industry. Right now, they're not doing very well at it. They're stumbling around, but within a five to 10 year horizon, they probably will get there. We've been under the illusion that China was fragile. It's been much more robust than we expected. We were under the illusion that, as Mike Pompeo put it, we could engage and empower the Chinese people and treat the Chinese Communist Party as a passing aberration. For the time being, the Chinese Communist Party is the power in China with whom we have to deal. We may not like it, that might change, but we can't count on a changing. We've had a great deal to say about blatant human rights violations in China. I don't believe that has a great deal of impact. 
the Chinese mainlanders have never cared much about Hong Kong. And as far as the Uyghurs are concerned, the average taxi driver in Shanghai will tell you, well, let's kill them all. They're less than 1% of the Chinese population. The Chinese are <clears throat> some of the world's biggest racists, and they really do not weep for the fate of the Uyghurs. <clears throat> that leaves us with the issue of technological competition with China, with which I'd like to close. Credit where it's due, a lot of people in and around the Biden camp have been saying the right things about rebuilding American technology. I have great skepticism that the Biden administration will execute this correctly. Charles Schumer is peddling a $37 billion support bill for the semiconductor industry of the United States. Sounds like a lot of money until you note that Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation alone has a $25 billion R&D budget. The United States is spending, well, the United States now produces 12%, roughly, probably less, of the world's computer chips and only older generation. Intel tried very hard to make some of the one generation before chips with a seven nanometer uh, gate width and failed to. So they're outsourcing to the Taiwanese. Now, a number of us have been screaming for years about semiconductors as a strategic industry. Henry Crisell and I wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in November 2016 saying this should be a top priority. Um, the Trump administration sadly did not address it. The Democrats are addressing it, but uh, in a very limited and uh, inadequate fashion. Uh, the report I mentioned, the Eric Schmidt Bob Work Report from the National Security Council for Artificial Intelligence, has one number which struck me, which is $40 billion for artificial intelligence. That sounds like a lot, until you realize the Chinese technology budget for the next five years is $1.4 trillion, decided last spring at uh, the National People's Congress. So they apologetically say, the, the work in Schmidt, well, this is just a down payment, but we think this is what's politically manageable right now. It is, in my view, completely insane for the United States to be throwing $1.9 trillion out of a helicopter and debating about a few billion dollars for technology. We're simply building up debt for the future. We're not creating the capacity to repay it. And of course, at a universities, we're we should be trying to get the smartest kids to study engineering. We're discouraging people from going in, into engineering by turning it over to diversity officers. We're going in the wrong direction. Does it mean we've lost? By no means. By no means. Chinese system, this exam-based meritocracy, is very good at producing people with high-functioning mediocrity. It's not very good at producing the kind of oddballs and eccentrics who do the really creative work. The Chinese are good at a Manhattan project. If you tell the, if the, tell the Chinese, here's what you're going to do. You're going to create a five nanometer gate width transistor chip, and you're going to do it in six years. They'll do it. As uh, a senior Chinese uh, tech executive told me, you don't understand China. They'll put 10,000 engineers on a project. They'll throw resources at it until they get it done. And that's impressive, and it's not to be deprecated. But that's not how we became the power we are today. Frank Gaffney, who I acknowledge in the audience, one of the people I've looked up to for years as a defense official in the Reagan administration, knows this better than I do. Every single major discovery we made that went into the digital age, and that includes microprocessors, CMOS chip processing, plasma displays, LED displays, semiconductor lasers, and optical networks. Without a single exception, every major discovery we discovered by accident. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, came up with something they wanted GE labs or IBM labs or RCA labs to look into. And some engineer came up with something that said, wait a minute, we can also use this for this. 
It was the flexibility and creativity and ingenuity of Americans that, tra that allowed us to deal with the unknown unknowns. Chinese can deal with unknowns, but not with unknown unknowns. So I strongly believe the West, the United States and its allies, have the capacity to outstrip China. We're not doing it. It's a tortoise and hare situation. We're the hare, but if we sleep through this, the tortoise is going to win the race. If that happens, it would be a tragedy for the United States, and indeed a tragedy for the whole world. It's not necessary. And I think that should, we should keep that in mind when we walk out of the door and get up in the morning and think of how we should respond to this. With that, I thank you very much for your attention and thank the Claremont Institute. I'll be glad to take questions if there are any. Yes, Sean. David, you mentioned the reserve currency issue in passing, but it seems to me that a great deal of our, of our dominance is related to the, the dollar status in the world. How do you see that playing out with the debt and with the other financial issues of the last recent years? And do you think China actually wants to replace the dollar? Or do you think if and when they have the financial and economic power to push us aside, as we did to the British after World War II, uh, that, they, that they would, that they would like to inherit the reserve currency? I don't think the, Chi the Chinese, well, when the British replaced Napoleonic France as a dominant power in Europe, it was a totally different empire than Napoleon's. And when we replaced the British, our, we were not an empire at all. Our dominant position was not imperial. It was nothing like the British. And if, God forbid, the Chinese replace us, it will be different. It will not be the same kind of thing. The Chinese do not want to... Um, repeat the American experience with a reserve currency. Certainly not soon, for several reasons. First, a reserve currency is double-edged. If you let the whole world use your currency, then you get capital outflows as well as inflows. You subject your own market to international pressures. The Chinese aren't ready for it. Their population simply isn't ready to keep their assets in liquid instruments. Most Chinese savings are in houses. Only 8% of Chinese wealth is in equities, as opposed to about 35% in the United States. Their banking system is a disaster because all a state bank is in China is a bucket full of cash with a guy next, uh, next to it holding a shovel. And then people come along from state enterprises with smaller buckets, and the fellow at the big with a big bucket, the shovel puts money into their, their bucket. So China has an enormous debt management problem, of which they're painfully aware. They talk about all the time. They need to delever, and they need to replace uh, a state-run banking system with market discipline that can distinguish a good credit from a bad credit. Uh, so they don't, they're in no position to run a reserve currency right now. They're painfully aware of it. However, what the digital yuan offers is a different kind of approach to international trade. If you'll pardon the digression, uh, Nathan Rothschild was asked to testify before a parliamentary commission in the 1790s. He was asked, how do you tell a genuine from a counterfeit bill of exchange in, internet, in trade? He said, you bite it. If it tastes of salt, it's genuine because it accompanied goods on a, on a sea voyage. So we're still in that world where you have bills of exchange which tie up a great deal of capital in international trade. If you want to buy, if you're in Wisconsin and you want to buy widgets from Wuhan, you get your bank to issue a banker's acceptance which will be payable to the exporter usually in 90 days and you have to put up the money for it up front, so you, you, you have a bank balance. And the $30 trillion of 
international bank deposits, as reported by the Bank for International Settlements, largely reflect the collateral, the working capital, that importers and exporters use in international trade. Now, with blockchain technology, which includes digital currencies, you can associate a payment with a transparent system which tracks through a distributed ledger every boatload of iron ore that comes out of Brazil to every warehouse in Harbin, to every steel mill in Manchuria, to every rebar to a warehouse in Shanghai, so that the information content is so rich you need much less collateral for trade. You don't have to put up $30 trillion of deposits. So replacing uh, the dollar as a reserve currency is not simply a matter of the Chinese doing what we used to do. It's a matter of applying fintech and blockchain technology, which would vastly increase the productivity of money or reduce the need for working balances and reduce the need for reserve currencies to begin with. And that's the real risk. Uh, it's it, That fintech replaces a great deal of the existing banking system. So in that respect, <clears throat> the danger is we lose tens of trillions of dollars of seniorage. This is a five to 10 year prospect, but the Chinese are patient. They don't expect us to disappear in two years, but the, the real crunch that will come from our orgy of debt issuance, in my view, is a three, four, five year kind of situation. It's not a 2022 or 2023 problem. And the danger is we get overconfident. I mean, you know, you, you may feel the best when you've just blown out your credit cards uh, at a drinking binge at the world's best restaurant, but the hangover is going to be miserable. Yes? One thing you haven't really touched on is America's green policies and how our massive investment uh, that seems to be impending in solar, wind, and electric vehicles runs through supply chains that seem to be utterly dominated by China and their ownership of about 80% of the rare earth market. Uh, to what extent should we be concerned about our attempt to subsidize a transition away from carbon-based fuel to uh, a kind of technology that it seems like we don't have the lead in? Well, we certainly have major vulnerabilities there. I've, I've talked to uh, any number of people in U.S. industry whose nightmare scenario is that the United States keeps tightening the screws on Chinese access to American technology or to third-party technology. So, for example, Taiwan Semiconductor cannot fabricate chips for Huawei, even though it's not an American company, because a lot of the intellectual property it uses and some of the machines are American-made. China could retaliate by cutting off rare earth exports to the United States, which would cripple a number of industries. So having any of these dependencies is a bad idea in the first place. And secondly, having these dependencies and picking a fight with China when they have the ability to retaliate is something we may not have thought through. Now, personally, I agree with, I agree with Bill Gates. The answer to carbon is nuclear. China is building more nuclear plants than anyone else. They bought the old Westinghouse Toshiba technology. They probably have the best nuclear technology in the world. The fact that we let China get ahead of nuclear technology is yet another of those catastrophic errors that we made. So yes, I share those concerns. And there are many vulnerabilities that we have, which I, I don't believe anyone in Washington has adequately studied. There may be people at the Pentagon who've been through this, but nothing's been published. Yes, Nate. Um, you've, uh, made, uh, you've made reference to America's oddball geniuses, and it's an interesting question. Um, the, the, we've been very dependent on the, uh, the five of the worth of the world, or the Steve Wozniaks, or I think of, for example, Bill Shockley coming up with this, the uh, solid state transistor in his hotel room on New Year's Eve, precisely because he would be mad that someone had come up with a, with a preliminary transistor design before him. What's holding these people back? That's a very good question. Uh, there was a fascinating report by a subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee on tech monopolies, 
which took a lot of testimony, arguing that the fact that we have these massive tech monopolies is crushing innovation and entrepreneurship in the United States. So I think that's certainly part of the answer. I just I actually have in, uh, uh, in preparation an article about this for the Journal of American Affairs. Uh, we also have tech companies that have ceased to be inventors but are really patent trolls who make it very difficult for inventors to realize you know, profits on their, uh, on their technology and hold innovation back. So I think that's a big part of the problem. Another part of the problem is that the kind of incubators we used to have that allowed so many of these inventors to have the resources to explore these things, uh, the corporate labs supported by DARPA have disappeared. Back in the Reagan administration, federal R&D was, what, about 1.4% of gross domestic product, so you know, like the equivalent of $300 billion now. Now it's down to, I think, about half that level, about 0 0.7, 0 0.8. I forget the exact numbers. Um, uh, there's uh, actually a good piece in the current Foreign Affairs by Christopher Darby that reviews all these data. So the fact that <coughs> we don't spend the money on basic research, we don't have the corporate or the government commitment to have laboratories that give people room to explore such things is a major factor in that. Uh, and I think third, um, remember, we had a huge wave of talent coming to the United States during World War II. We had the famous, um, you know, the story about the atom bomb being a Budapest high school science fair project because it was uh, Wigner and Teller and von Neumann who uh, all went to the same high school and built this thing. And the students of, uh, of this generation were incredibly creative people. So we had, when we had big science, you talk about big science, this wasn't a bunch of bureaucrats uh, enriching themselves. You had people like Edward Teller, who was an authentic genius, who befriended Ronald Reagan when he was governor of California and sold him on the, sold him on the idea of missile defense. And we, we don't have that kind of leadership anymore. You don't have figures that have that kind of weight and moral and intellectual authority. So I, I could think of other reasons, but those are probably the first three that come to mind. Yes? And how, if at all, do you think COVID will change and shape the U.S.-China relationship? And uh, how should it? Well, it's made everybody hate China. If you look at a recent Pew survey, Attitudes Toward China Around the World, People really hate China. China was you know, clearly irresponsible, at, at best irresponsible, with COVID-19. You know, I very much doubt anyone will prove that it was a, a Chinese biowarfare operation, but uh, that's certainly, that plus the arrogance and bullying of Chinese diplomacy in the wake of COVID-19 has really made China hated. So I think the U.S. population has a very different attitude towards China than it did before, but that, and the whole world population does. It's true in Western Europe. However, uh, power is power, and if China is the biggest market for your goods, you're going to go there, or you're going to go out of business. So although China is hated in the opinion polls, it's more influential in Germany than it ever has been before. How should it change it? It should, let it, it should make us painfully aware that we can't be dependent on Chinese technology. But tragically, as I mentioned, if you look at the import numbers, we are now more dependent than we've ever been. So we've gone in the wrong direction. And that, that I find deeply disturbing. Uh, yes, and then there and there. Yes. You mentioned And one of the titles of the phase one deal that the Trump administration struck with China included uh, some opening of the financial markets in China to American financial institutions. That's right. Including some of the state banks. So I wanted to hear your perspective. 
perspective on how greater integration between American financial institutions and Chinese financial markets plays into both the financial uh, uh, financial shift that you've been describing, um, but also how I think prior to the export boom that we saw during 2020 with COVID, 2019 was the first year I think in a long time that China was a net importer of foreign capital. Um, so I, I, I'm curious to see it, how. Well, uh, 2019 is complicated because the Chinese, uh, re I'll, I'll get back to that. That, that, that's, the Chinese would love to have American financial institutions come in and help them straighten out their financial system. They simply don't have the financial talent. That's all been scooped up by the West. Uh, old colleague of mine from Bank of America, Chinese American is now the head of trading and sales and research at one of the big Chinese banks, one of the top four. He said, Goldman Sachs probably has 4,000 people in its fixed income business. I have 35. So to try to, I mean, you're talking about giants with big muscles and a tiny head. <laughs> who don't have the staff or the talent or the culture to deal with these things. So the Chinese are now letting the J.P. Morgans and the Black Rocks and the Goldman Sachs in the world own wholly owned subsidiaries. Previously, they had to have a Chinese majority partner. And from the Chinese standpoint, they want American expertise to help them make their, Chinese, their system more efficient within certain limits. I don't think the Chinese are, you know, they're, they're, they're stumbling along. Uh, there was a lot of speculation that when uh, the uh, Chinese government scotched the uh, Ant Financial IPO last November, that was supposed to be a $240 billion IPO, it reflected personal enmity between Jack Ma and Xi Jinping, or it was an effort by the communists to suppress the capitalists. In fact, I'm sure there was some of that without any doubt, but it's also true that Jack Ma was making out like a bandit putting on huge amounts of leverage and over-advertising, over-hyping the systems he used for credit risk management. So I think the regulators were probably quite wise to postpone that and force Ant Financial to put up a great deal more capital. So yes, uh, you could say we're, uh, we're selling the Chinese the rope with which to hang us. Uh, the U.S. financial institutions will help the Chinese rationalize their debt system. And the Chinese seem to me to be doing a reasonably competent job of uh, slowly improving their system. And it'll take years to do it, but they're going in the right direction generally. Now, as far as 2019, China's reserves went down by a trillion dollars. But at the same time, Chinese corporations reduced their foreign liabilities by a trillion dollars. So China's net foreign asset position didn't change. And this was actually well analyzed by the economists at Bank for International Settlements. I'd have to look up which issue with their quarterly report. This was largely due to the fact that the Chinese uh, devalued the UN. So a lot of uh, Chinese companies thought they had a one-way bet on the UN and had taken out all their debt in dollars in the expectation that they'd be able to pay it back with more expensive local currency. And when the Chinese did the UN devaluation, they all scrambled to square their books and they paid down a trillion dollars worth of debt. And the central bank financed that, but there really was very little net change in flows. It was much more a bookkeeping shift from a state bank to state-owned companies. So the account of China, the account of the Chinese government, with respect to the rest of the world in dollars, didn't change very much. Yes? Um, three things stand out to me in the technology space. One, that if we beat them in broadband, we're only going to use it for more entertainment and not actually industry. Two, that our economy is extremely dependent on the big technology companies in the US. And three, as much as we might, really, as much as conservatives might hate Facebook, I'm really glad that Facebook is in the US and not in China. Given that, how do we deal with the big tech argument and China's relationship to big tech and how much, you know, 
Congress ought to punish big tech for what they're doing? Well, uh, I don't know the answer to all those questions. Uh, certainly, the biggest problem we have in the United States, in my view, is that sometime in the early 2000s, big tech made a decision that they'd make more money in software than in manufacturing. So we should let China do the manufacturing and sell us cheap hardware, and we'd sell expensive software. The great thing about software is the marginal cost of adding a customer is zero. You just put in your credit card, go to the uh, you know, website and download it. The marginal cost of adding a customer if you're producing a piece of hardware is substantial. So that arrangement is what people called Shy America. And it was great for big tech. They loved it. They didn't want to manufacture. So I think that in some cases you have to, uh, dis you have to restrict uh, big tech's capacity. And that's certainly the case with Google. You can't just have one search engine. In the case of Facebook, um, you have a different issue, which is can a private, uh, are they a public utility and are they subject to constitutional guarantees of free speech or are they a private company that can let people say whatever they want? And that's a constitutional issue we have to debate out. I'm horrified by the fact that conservatives have been silenced by Facebook and Twitter. And Amazon, uh, Ryan Anderson is a brilliant writer, student of my friend Robert, uh, Robert P. George, wrote a book questioning the whole transgender ideology called When Harry Became Sally. And Amazon removed it from the list. You can't buy from Amazon. You can't buy from, Amazon also controls the used, the used book trade search mechanism. So Amazon can shut down books as well. That's got to be addressed on a constitutional level. Uh, and I, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but I consider the current situation intolerable. Much more, we have to find ways of getting America's talent back into manufacturing. The idea that you can do everything with software is delusional because when you're actually trying to make something, you get physicists, engineers, and skilled workers together to determine what's practical and what's not. Um, I'm very skeptical, for example, of the idea that you could have a software-based alternative to 5G. Uh, it's called the Open Radio Access Network, and it's a very popular idea. Oh, that would be the sixth generation. Uh, the experts I've talked to, for what it's worth, think it'll take five years for, <coughs> for this software-based system to work, if it works at all, by which time the Chinese will have built out their network for years and have already implemented most of the downstream applications. So these are complex issues. Um, I'm working with Claremont on a number of these things. We'll have some papers out later in the year. Um, in the meantime, uh, a foundation called American Compass last year did a, I think, pretty useful symposium on onshoring to which I contributed the introduction. You can find that on the website of the American Compass. So a lot to be said about it. But let me just refer you to the, the stuff we've already published. Thanks. Yes? Uh, two part. Uh, so I think that the point uh, about Facebook being based in the US is actually very helpful. It's a good example of how to communicate with people who are like, you know, screw big tech. We don't care about them. It's like, well, we'd rather they be here than there. Um, but I'm curious what you think are useful examples of China seeking dominance that are so clear that somebody who would normally dismiss you know, any concern about it as either racist or just conspiracy-minded, what do you think are the, most, are the most obvious ones that are good to... to, to well, to, to talk about seeking dominance, this is all in the public domain. You can go onto Huawei's website. They brag about it. My friends are not going to go on Huawei's website. <laughs> you know, I'm Forrest Gump. I stumbled into this stuff. I didn't, you know, do a doctorate in Chinese studies. 
I was an investment banker. And as an investment banker in Hong Kong, uh, I was asked by Huawei to make some introductions for them with the government of Mexico, where I had good contacts going back many years. It happened that the then ambassador to Washington was a good friend of mine. So I went to Mexico with some senior Huawei people, and I introduced them to members of the Mexican cabinet. And then I brought the Mexican ambassador to China to Huawei headquarters in Shenzhen, which is an amazing place, by the way. Next Stanford University looks like a, look like a slum. Um, <clears throat> so the Mexican ambassador <coughs> and the whole crew of diplomats went through this three-hour tour of Huawei technology and sat down in a room kind of like this, and some guy got up from Huawei with a PowerPoint and said, you are a big economy. You have bad broadband. That holds you back. Let us build broadband for you. Then you can be rich like China because we'll bring in e-finance, we'll bring in e-commerce, we'll bring in all the Chinese companies. It's not like the Borg. We will assimilate you. You will become part of China. You'll be, and you will have prosperity and harmony. So that, that's all on the website. That's, that's what Huawei does. And what makes it so dangerous is that everything China does is not wrong. In the case of Mexico, they came in, they did build the broadband, and they cut the cost of broadband by three quarters in Mexico. So Mexico went from having 23 mobile broadband accounts per 100 people to 77 in five years. The thing that should scare us is not what the Chinese do wrong, but what they do right. Because for people, particularly in the third world, who sit around you know, in the informal economy, 60% of Mexicans are in the informal economy, don't pay taxes, don't have a bank account, scratch a living. You get them on broadband, you bring them into the world market, you improve their living standards. That's the Chinese model. You rip out the old economy by the roots, you move 600 million people from the countryside to the cities, you put them in manufacturing, you build up wealth, and you know what everyone's doing at all times because you have their smartphone and face recognition and so forth. That's the bargain. But everything that China does by building infrastructure is not a wicked plot to get people into a debt trap. Some of it actually creates some value. I mean, not, not by accident, Chinese personal, since Deng Xiaoping started his market reform, it's 1979, personal income per capita in China has gone up tenfold which is, to my knowledge, a unique accomplishment in world history. So I'm worried about what they do right more than what they do wrong. What they do wrong, you know, they, they kill people. You know, the, the, you know, if you're a dissident, you're likely to be a kidney donor. This, they do horrible things. Donor is a terrible term. But I had, a, I had a, a sort of, I guess, follow up on the things that they do wrong, which is that you had mentioned that they would cut off rare earth minerals, that they, that they could exercise that authority, which I think would be sort of like an economic Stalingrad, which is, you know, you'd be, you'd be pushing very far, but you'd have a lot of downside risk on that. Um, do you think that China would be willing and could sustain an economic Stalingrad like that? Well, <coughs> I think that a serious trade war would be really destructive for both the United States and China. It's very hard to know who would be hurt the most. I mean, China exported 35% of its GDP in 2007. Now it's down to 18%. The U.S. is 4% of GDP. The U.S. exports the U.S. like 4% of Chinese GDP. Maybe they went up a little bit because exports popped up, but the China, Chinese economy is not dependent on exports to the U.S. anymore. It was in 2007. So it wouldn't destroy China's economy. Uh, but lots of things could hurt China very badly. The same is true for China's ability to hurt the United States. So, and it probably wouldn't be limited to a tech war because in the middle of all this is the source of the vast majority of the world's advanced chips, which is Taiwan. So there'd be a tug of war over Taiwan and possibly a war over it. 
So if we went down that route, the situation would be extremely unpredictable. I couldn't begin to guess what would happen, but my guess is nothing good. And I hope it doesn't come to that. Yes. Question. Oh, just uh, I didn't see you mention it. I mean, I've, obviously your book is more focused on on long term, but uh, more in more of a short term question, do you think she stays beyond twenty twenty two? Yes. I mean, the, the state council is a very mixed bunch of people. She, my impression of him is that he's a provincial party thug. Came up the ranks local party organizations, he's a nasty guy and not particularly imaginative. On the other hand, you have people like Lee ka Chung, who's the premier, who's in charge of economic policy. Lee is very suave, speaks good English. A uh, good friend of mine is the uh, conservative economist uh, Edmund Phelps. Lee ka Chung gave him the China Friendship Award and arranged for his book, Mass Flourishing, to be translated into Chinese. And that's all about entrepreneurship, bottom-up economic effort, and so forth. So I think the collective leadership in the uh, Chinese Communist Party is not going to want to make any significant changes soon, uh, unless there's some real disaster. Chinese leaders get thrown out when they louse up. And she so far hasn't. I mean, from the Chinese standpoint, the suppression of the COVID-19 epidemic was a reasonably impressive achievement. Remember, in the spring of 2020, the words Chernobyl moment were on everyone's lips. I read 50 different articles saying this is China's Chernobyl moment. Uh, no such thing happened. They got it under control. So she can say, well, look, you know, I did a pretty good job, and no one is going to uh, question him on that. So uh, I think for the moment, Xi's position is probably pretty secure, unfortunately. He's a nasty piece of work. Yeah, I got to meet him when he was uh, the Shanghai party chief, when they were doing some uh, workups for the World Expo back in, like, 2008, and I see literally exactly how I described him, the Chinese Tony Soprano. Yeah. Uh, in the book, I compared the chi Chinese governance to the mafia. Uh, it, basically, the reason you need an emperor is you need a capo di tutti capi to prevent all the other underbosses from killing each other. So the Chinese don't like their government any more than the people in Little Italy like the capo di tutti capi, but they consider it an unfortunate necessity of life, keeps the peace, there's no crime in the streets. One thing about China compared to other developing countries is you never see guns in the street, ever. You go around to Turkey or Mexico or Brazil, the place is bristling with weapons. It's like a gun fair. Every bank has you know, somebody with a shotgun in front of it. The Chinese authorities don't have to show their guns because everyone knows they're being watched at all times. Anyway, thank you very much. Pleasure to visit with you.